As I just said a couple minutes ago, I, I really enjoyed the services this morning. Just the mere thought of Christ and the, uh, the celebration surrounding his return, that just makes my heart soar. Amen. I love that stuff. I am absolutely longing for it, as I'm sure you are as well. Amen. And so in light of that, I, I just thought I'd like to preach a second message tonight from the Revelation, and, and one that in, in many ways is actually the sequel to what we saw this morning, to what we, the text we read this morning. And so I'd just like for us to look at that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the, to the book of Revelation again, this time to chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, please. Go ahead and stand together once you find it. We'll read the first seven verses. Revelation 10, and I saw, this is John writing, John says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, uh, 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 Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel, which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets." This is so good. I love this stuff. I want to preach to you a, te a message tonight entitled, I, I, I love this title. This is my language. The jig is up. The jig is up. Because that's what this is. That is exactly what this is about. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And God, we're so thankful for your word. It's so encouraging. It's just awesome. The beauty of the text. The message of it, uh, everything about it, Lord, it just, it makes us rejoice. Help me to communicate it, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, it would be almost impossible in the very short amount of time that we have uh, tonight to explain to you all the different opinions that surround this text. The speculation is almost endless. And part of the problem... Um, when you come to a passage like this, especially, there's a huge problem that under that uh, that is at the foundation of so many different interpretations, and that is the chronology to which an interpreter subscribes. And depending on whether or not you take the book as, if you believe that the Book of Revelation is laid out sequentially, like it unfolds in chronological order, the events of chapter two follow those of chapter one, which follows chapter. You know, chapter 5 follows chapter 4 and so on and so forth. If you, just, if you believe that, then it sets you on a particular path of interpretation and you cannot get around it. And so to be consistent with, their, with the chronological understanding of the book, which many, many expositors hold to, if they're going to be consistent to that, when they get to a chapter like this, they just, they're tied in knots. They don't know what to do with it. Right, And you can see what I mean when you, in the very first verse, you'll notice here it says, I saw another angel, a mighty angel, come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now let me ask you a question. Who is this angel? Who is this? Well, there are two options. Somebody tonight has said it's either 
well, we have two choices. It can either be a, a very powerful angel in the ordinary sense of that word, like Michael or, or Gabriel or something like that, a very strong angel that way, or it can refer to the Lord Jesus himself. And, and it would be here uh, calling him an angel as he was so many times in the Old Testament known as the angel of the Lord. Who, as you find out in many of the Old Testament passages, is in fact the Lord himself. Amen. Okay? And so we have to ask ourselves, which is it? Is it a strong angel like Gabriel or Michael or one, some other angel that we don't know their name? Or is it the Lord Jesus? Now, most commentators who follow a sequential or a chronological approach to the book say it is a regular angel. John Walvoord, for example, who is a wonderful expositor, he says it must, listen to this language, he says it must be an angel because there is no evidence that Christ comes down from heaven to earth midway in the tribulation. Okay. Well, uh, that's true, of course, but it's completely irrelevant because if you have your chronology straight, you know that the seventh trumpet is not the middle of the tribulation. All right? The seventh trumpet is at the end of the tribulation. All right? And so it's the, the, second, the seventh trumpet just denotes the, se the second coming of Christ. So here's the point I'm trying to get across. I'm totally convinced that this is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. No doubt about it. And I'm going to hope to show, as I hope to show you tonight, there, everything in this chapter supports that position. Everything. I want you to notice what we're first told about him. In verse 1, let me read it again. It says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now, he is described here as a mighty angel. Now, look, I agree that when nothing other, when that is all that's said, when no more is said of an angel than simply that he is strong or that he is mighty, well, then we have... No reason to suspect anything but a created being because all angels are powerful, especially compared to humans. All right. But notice here that when the strength of the angel is referred to as a mark of distinction. Especially among the other mighty angels. And, and when that strength is referred to in a list of other attributes that do not properly belong to regular angels then the term should here be understood to denote not just mighty, but almighty, right? And thus it speaks of someone who is uncreated and divine. Secondly, notice this. John describes him as clothed with a cloud. Now that ought to stand out to you. Because throughout the Bible, whenever you find clouds connected with a supernatural manifestation, it is invariably associated with the presence of deity. For example, all the way back in Exodus chapter 19, the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai. And how did he come down? He descended in a thick cloud, right? He appeared on the mercy seat in a cloud. When Israel was delivered, the Lord went before them in the pillar of fire by night and in, in the daytime in the pillar of what? A cloud. When the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, the Bible says a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. When God reproached Israel for their murmurings, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Moreover, the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. Psalm 104, the psalmist lists clouds as characteristic of the Almighty, saying, Clouds and darkness are round about him. He says also that he maketh clouds his chariot and that about him are thick clouds. Even more significantly, in the New Testament, whenever Jesus referred to coming back in power, clouds are always part of the imagery. In Matthew 26, 64, standing before the Sanhedrin, Jesus said, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of, the, of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And even here in Revelation, back in chapter 1 and verse 7, when the king of glory returns in divine majesty to judge the earth, the exclamation is, behold, he cometh with clouds. Dear friend, I'm here to tell you tonight, clouds are, are the uniform, so to speak, of almighty God when he comes to wage war against fallen man. They indicate his infinite majesty and his consuming power towards sin, which cannot live before his uncovered glory. 
No mere angel is ever arrayed in such drapery, and therefore this is not an angel. It is the God-man himself. This is the Lord Jesus pictured in the administrations of his judgment. Third, notice this. We're told that there was something like a, a rainbow was upon his head. A rainbow was upon his head. Now, I want, you, I want to point out something. If you read this in, the, in Greek, in what's called the Textus Receptus, which is the Greek manuscript behind the King James Bible, you will find that it is not a rainbow. It's not an indefinite. There's no indefinite article. There's a definite article. It is the rainbow. The rainbow. And be, but because there is no apparent antecedent in the, in the verse, nothing for it to refer back to, uh, they just left it indefinite, a rainbow. But in fact, there is an antecedent. Because in this book, in the book of the Revelation, the only other rainbow that we have found so far is found in chapter 4 in connection with the throne of God himself. God is upon the throne and a rainbow is round his head in sight like unto an emerald, the Bible says. Remember that? And that's the only place in the whole book where we find that, and it's talking about the very throne of God. And here we have the rainbow around his head. Right? What's more, the rainbow was originally ordained as God's mark in the cloud. And it was, his, it was the sign of his covenant. Not the covenant of an angel with man, but the covenant of God with man. We never read of anyone else surrounded with a rainbow but God. And just as the clouds are indicative of divine judgment and storms and floods of wrath, so the rainbow is indicative of divine mercy in the midst of judgment. It is a reminder to us of God's unbreakable covenant of security to the believers, even though everything to be, seems to be headed towards destruction. Now, we're going to see more of this in just a minute. But I'm just saying, clouds, the rainbow, we know who we're dealing with here. No question. Next, we're told this. His face was, as it were, the sun. Yeah. <laughs> right? And here again, this almost unmistakably identifies him, as the same, this, this angel, as the same person who appeared to John all the way back in chapter 1 in his first vision. Because there in chapter 1, it was said of the Lord Jesus Christ, who walks in the midst of the golden candlesticks, that his countenance was as the sun when it's shining in its strength. All right, all over the New Testament, this same description is given to Christ in his glory. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, the apostle Peter spoke of Jesus' appearance on the Mount of Transfiguration as, as being a foretaste of the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you go back and read it, the account in Matthew 17 and verse 2, the record is, his face did shine as the sun. His face did shine as the sun. At his conversion on his way to Damascus, the same vision was given to Saul of Tarsus. Jesus appeared to him in a vision. And what does the, what does the text say? He was, it was as above the brightness of the sun. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets referred to him as the very outshining of the glory of God. And they called him the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. Right? It's clear who this is. Finally, fifth. The Bible says his feet were as pillars of fire. J. A. Seiss so eloquently points out, he said, these are manifestly the same feet which John beheld in the visions of the first chapter. There they dazzled the eyes of the seer like the fine brass melted and glowing in a furnace. And they were the feet of him who was dead but is alive forevermore and who has the keys of death and hell. There in chapter 1 they presented an image of terrible pureness. Here they furnish an image of consuming majesty which no one can encounter and live. But nothing of the kind is ever affirmed of a created angel. So is everybody listening tonight? Amen. I mean, this is just obvious. I mean, well, not all of you are convinced, it doesn't sound like. Amen. Okay, well, if you're not convinced, then skip down to the middle of verse 2. Here we're told, he set, watch this, he set his right foot on the land, and his left foot, or right foot upon the sea, excuse me, and his left foot upon the earth. Dear friends, now this is one of the most significant acts in the whole vision of Revelation. For as almost all scholars note, everybody on all sides has agreed about this. 
Planting your feet upon a place, especially in biblical language, signifies your intention to take possession of it. Right? I mean, think about it. Go back to the Old Testament. God said to Israel, every place where the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Right? Again, that's Deuteronomy 11 to 24. Again, the same decree is repeated to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, God said, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. And so here in chapter 10, by setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, whoever this is, this person asserts their intention to take the earth in its entirety as their own. I mean, it's clear. And to establish, he's going to establish his, his uh, you know, power, his occupancy, and rule over it. Now, friend, think about it. That is something perfectly fitting for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's no question about it. That's perfectly fitting the character and the office of Christ. But that is entirely inappropriate for a created angel. Who do you think you are? This is just not, this is no way, no created angel. Jesus alone is the rightful sovereign of creation. And that's the whole point of our study this morning. Right? The whole point of chapter 5 is that no one but the slain lamb. Remember what they said? Who has the right to take the book and open the scroll? Who has the right to redeem the creation? And they look throughout all of heaven and all the angels strike back. No angel could do this. There's no possible way. Only the lion of the tribe of Judah has the right to take the book from the hand of eternal majesty. But he did take it in chapter 5. And he loosed the seals thereof, thereby proving his unique and legitimate right to repossess Adam's forfeited inheritance. And here in chapter 10, we have the assertion of that right and his purpose to enforce it. Right? Long, long has both sea and land been under the dominion of his enemy. But here he sets a foot on each and takes hold upon them as his own. Amen. Hallelujah. It's exactly what you're reading here. In verse 3, we have yet another connection. Here the Bible says, He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. I mean, look at the imagery. Friend, this is not the cry of distress. This is not a cry of fear. This is the shout of power. The, power, the cry of authority. It's the announcement, essentially, of vengeance upon enemies and usurpers. Yeah. Right? We've already seen. I mean, this is, this is a warning. I'm here to repossess what is mine. Yeah. Right? And squatters are going to be evicted right now. We've already seen. Who, who is the lion? Chapter 5. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? We know who it is. And long before that, in Jeremiah 25, the prophet declared, The Lord, the Lord, listen to it, the Lord shall roar on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. And he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. And he shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. That's exactly the context of Revelation. That's exactly what we're reading about here. This verse in Revelation directly connects with that prophecy. This is not the voice of a created angel. It's the cry of the Almighty Judge himself. And when he comes to set his feet upon the earth, the shout, like those who tread the grape, shall be given, and the winepress of divine fury shall be trodden. Oh, this is good, friends. This is the soon coming judgment of God. And again, that's precisely the significance of the seven thunders in verse 3. It says, when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Look, I, I don't know if you've picked it up yet or not. But almost everything in this vision, almost everything that we're reading here in chapter 10, is rooted in, harks back to chapters 4 and 5. That's what it's about. Everything goes back to that opening scene of the throne room in heaven. Right? In chapter 4, John saw a rainbow encircling the throne. And here he speaks of the rainbow as upon the head of the mighty angel. In verse 5 of that same vision, John noted that out of the throne go forth lightnings and thunderings and voices. Now there's no mention of how many thunders there. Uh, but we are told that there were seven lamps of fire and seven spirits of God. So it seems likely that in chapter 4 there were seven. Alright, so these then are the seven thunders of divine 
indignation uh, emanating from the throne of God. And when the lion from the tribe of Judah gives his roar, it's on the eve of his bounding forth to devour his prey. And the seven thunders utter themselves in full, full sympathy, as it were, with the righteous vengeance about to be visited upon the guilty and rebellious world. Is everybody with me still? You're still not convinced? Okay. Someone says, no, I'm not convinced. This, this can't be Christ. Because in verses 5 and 6, the Bible says that he lifts up his hand to swear by God. Well, so that has to mean that God is greater than, than this angel. Whoa, whoa, now hold it, hold it. In Genesis 15, the Bible says that when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Amen. This is Jesus just as sure as I'm standing here, friends. Now, the question is, what's he doing here? What's he doing? Well, there are two clues in the text to help us answer that question. One comes from verse 2, and the other is found in verse 7. In verse 2, John says that in the angel's hand, there is a little book. Does this sound familiar or what? There's a little book. There's a scroll that has been opened. It's been opened. Now, we've already been introduced to this book once before. Back in chapter 5 that we read this morning. And in chapter 5, what was the characteristic of that book? It was still what? Rolled up and sealed. It was closed. It was, in fact, it was sealed with seven seals. And as we learned this morning, that sealed book was none other than the title deed to the universe. That was Adam's forfeited inheritance that Jesus purchased back at the incredible cost of his own sinless blood. Now again, some commentators ridicule the idea that this book in chapter 10 and that book in chapter 5 could be one and the same. But let me ask you a question. Did you see how much drama there was surrounding that book in chapter 5? It just comes out of nowhere and it's the title deed to the universe and, and it's like everything revolves around it. Wouldn't it be strange, wouldn't it be strange for there to be such fanfare, such drama attached to the book in chapter 5 so that all of heaven and all of earth trembles and shakes at the breaking of those seals in chapter 6 and 7 and 8? Wouldn't it be weird, wouldn't it be strange for Don to suggest that the seals must be broken and that the book must be opened and that the true owner of the title deed can be revealed so that God's rightful rule of this world can finally commence? Wouldn't it be weird to go through all of that and then to never refer to it again? Dear friends, it's more than strange. The notion is preposterous. It's impossible. The whole scene before us demands the presence of the same document which the Lamb took from the throne. It was sealed. He has now opened it and said, See, I have redeemed it. It is mine. Amen. That's what it's all about. Jesus is here formally laying claim to his own ownership of the earth. But watch, friends. He needs a warrant to do so. He needs a warrant to do so. Never forget, never forget tonight, redemption proceeds on a legal foundation. You understand? Christ, as our Redeemer, had to be made, the Bible says, under the law. Right? It was necessary that he should fulfill all righteousness, as he said to John. All of his successes, all of his triumphs, all of his exaltations were achieved on the basis of having perfectly met every demand of the law. Jesus couldn't rise from the dead and ascend to the right hand of the Father and offer free forgiveness to men, much let alone dare to repossess the forfeited inheritance of the universe unless he had first satisfactorily atoned for all of men's sins and in himself won and purchased all that he claims for his redeemed. Dear friends, it was only as he was slain for mankind and only as he atoned for their unrighteousness and thus overcame that he was pronounced worthy to take the book or open its seals and act as our great kinsman redeemer. Amen. 
Neither could he take possession of the earth, nor clear it of all its foes and usurpers without a legal warrant giving him that right as the just reward of his perfect righteousness. Listen, you can't just claim land without showing that you have the legal title to it. And so here, he brings the book. We call it today, he brings the receipts. Right? He's bringing the receipts and he opens it up, fully declaring, see, I told you, here it is, right here. I have purchased this with my own blood. He sets his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, in open proclamation that he is the rightful owner and sovereign of all. And with a mighty roar of authority, he challenges all the rebels of the earth and all the rebels of hell to yield or perish, surrender or die. I love it, man. Now, in verses 5 through 7, we get our second clue, which makes this even clearer. And I want to read it again to make sure that we understand what this is talking about. It says, The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him who liveth or that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. All right, so let's make sure we understand this. The picture here is of Christ declaring on his own authority that there will be time no longer. Now, what does that mean? It certainly does not mean that the abstract notion of time is going to disappear. Okay? Some people think in heaven we have no clocks and there will be no, you know, keeping track of it, no seconds or hours or days. That is not what this is saying at all. If you've ever heard that or have that notion in your mind, put it aside right now. That's false. By the way, that never happens. Time never ends. Let me just say that again. Time never ends. That's not what this is talking about at all. Okay? Think about it. Here we are in chapter 10. Time will be no more. What does it say in chapter 20? Satan's going to be bound for how long? A thousand years. So if time is no more, how do we get to happen a thousand years later than this? Does everybody understand? That's, it's just not what it's saying. What, it's, what it is saying is that the time is over. We say it like this. Time has expired The time is over. There will be no more. There's no, the time has run out. Okay? Like if you're playing a game and there's 60 seconds on the clock, we say, time's up. It's over. The game has ended. In other words, what's saying here is that that the time is over, there will be no more waiting, there will be no more delay, there will be no more time to, to pass before, we, before we're going to do this, something about it. The age, listen, the age of waiting will have come to an end. Somebody says, what age of waiting? What age of delay are you talking about? Look at verse 7. He tells us that it's the age of waiting for the mystery of God. That he, that he declared, the word there means to evangelize, that he evangelized to his servants, the prophets. Okay? He said the time that he told them about, in other words, all, the time that God told the prophets about has finally arrived. Amen. It's finally going to be finished. Amen. We've been having a countdown, waiting, 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 and finally there's no more time on the clock. It's come, it's arrived. Now, friend, the mystery of God is, what is this mystery of God that he evangelized to his prophets? The mystery of God is this long delay that he has allowed to, to, to happen without establishing righteousness in the earth. We've been talking about this on Wednesday nights. We're living in a world that is cursed by sin. 
in which there is sorrow and pain and suffering. And people down through the ages have said, oh God, why? Why are you allowing this? Why the suffering? Why the heartache? Why the pain? When is this going to be over? And the mystery of God, friends, is seen in these thousands of years in which sin and death has just run rampant. There is no city. There's not a single town without a dark backdrop. There's no life without tears and sorrows. There's no family that hasn't seen the circle of its home dissolve into the depths of the grave. There's no life that does not end in death. The pages of history from time uh, of the first murder until this present hour are written in blood and death and tears. And the mystery here is the delay, the waiting. Why has God taken so long in setting up the kingdom? Why has it taken so long? That's the most inexplicable mystery that any mind could ever dream up. The mystery of the presence of evil. And for thousands of years, God has allowed Satan to wrap his vicious little tentacles around human life and around this earth. We've talked about it. Does God know? Does God, is he aware of that? And if so, does he care? Is he indifferent to it? The fact, is he, does he care but just is simply not able to do anything about it? It's been a mystery for a lot of people and a hard one to suffer through. That mystery has brought more stumbling to the faith of God's people than any other experience in life. In fact, the atheists today, the infidels, the unbelievers, they laugh and mock at, at Christians and they mock God and God lets them laugh and mock. You know, if I had my way, when somebody shakes their fist in the face of God, they would be struck by lightning. But God doesn't do that. God is long-suffering. The enemies of righteousness and of everything that we hold dear, they rise to power and they spread blood and darkness over the face of the earth. And we wonder, where is God? Our missionaries get murdered like they were in Mexico. Our churches are burned to the ground. Countless millions live in despair and agony. And God does not intervene. It's a serious mystery of the delay of God. But beloved, according to this chapter, somewhere beyond the starry sky stands a seventh angel with a trumpet in hand. And by the decree of God Almighty, when that angel sounds, when he blows the trumpet, then the Bible says that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Oh, that mystery, friends, is going to be solved. Verse 7 in our chapter is emphatic. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the mystery of God shall be finished. It's over. The forbearance and long-suffering of God will finally end, and God will say to death, hey, this is your last victim. He'll say to Satan, no more waste, no more damnation. This is your last destruction, hallelujah. According to Revelation 10 and verse 7, these are the good tidings that God declared, that he evangelized to his servants, the prophets. And think about that phrase. The Greek phrase evangelized to the prophets is very meaningful. Because although the Old Testament prophetic writings are filled with woe and lamentation and heartache, you'll notice at the end of every one of the Old Testament prophets, they always somehow transcend, they see beyond the immediate judgment on the horizon. They see beyond the heartache to the glorious dawn of Messiah's rule. They know that a better day is coming. And that's why John uses this word evangelize, because he, in spite of all the heartache, in spite of all the sorrow, in spite of all the pain and suffering, he never lost sight of the good news that although victory is future, it is never in doubt. Amen. It is never in doubt. Amen. Now, friends, listen to me. Every generation, every generation of believers, from all the way back to Adam himself, every generation has lived with this hope and died without seeing it realized. But just as sure as Jesus Christ is the rightful owner and the rightful sovereign of this world, one day, in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, He's going to say to Satan, hey, buddy, the jig is up. 
The jig is up. Time has expired. The wait is over. I am coming back. And that, my friends, is exactly what the sound of the seventh trumpet brings. It announces for us the long-awaited and the glorious return of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and dear friends, that's what this is all about. That's what these seven verses are about. These seven verses give us the assurance and the timing of the establishment of the kingdom that we've all been waiting for. Amen. We know it's coming. Why? Because it is promised. It is assured to us by the eternality and the legal righteousness of Jesus Christ. He paid for it with his own blood. It is impossible that he will not receive it. Amen. When's it going to occur, someone says? It's going to occur at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. When's that going to be? Well, I don't know. But soon, hey man, soon, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, it's all going to be over. All God's people should say, amen. amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you tonight, and I'm so thankful for your awesome word. It's so encouraging. You've taken the book. One of these days, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take the book. He's going to loose the seals. He's going to open it and show for all the entire universe to see that he is the rightful owner and sovereign of this world and he intends to set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed wherein will dwell righteousness and peace and harmony and joy and glory like the world has never experienced before. And God, we are, as your people, longing for that day but we don't have to wait until it happens to rejoice in it. By faith, we can take comfort and solace right now. By faith, we can already rejoice. We can live. We know that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Though this world is in a terrible mess and is going to get worse, we have the promise. One day, the angel is going to sound that seventh trumpet and Jesus is going to return. And it's going to be the greatest day of our lives. God, we thank you for it. We rejoice in it. It's going to be wonderful. Bless your people tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's